Hello, good evening. Welcome to this School of Manentes lecture, the first for the 2023-2024 uh, year uh, program. Um, this inaugural lecture uh, will be given by Paula Birnbaum, uh, who is doing us a great, great pleasure, not only giving a lecture, but giving it here in Paris. And um, it's always um, more uh, enjoyable. Um, Paula Birnbaum is a professor of art history and museum studies at the University of San Francisco. Uh, her research focuses on modern contemporary art in relation to gender and sexuality, but also on institutional and social politics. Um, among the various articles and books she wrote, I'd like to mention three of them. The first is uh, entitled Essays on Women's Artistic and Cultural Contributions, 1919-1945, because it has echoes with tonight's lecture. It was published in 2009. Um, the second one is Women Artists in Interwar France, Framing Feminities, published in 2008. 11 and um, again in 2016. And the last is there, um, Sculpting a Life Between Paris and Tel Aviv, Chanel Love, uh, published just um, a few months before this year in two, um, 2023. Um, as I said, tonight's lecture is devoted to the uh, sculptress Chanel Love. Um, Paula uh, chose to entitle it Chanel Love, a Modern Woman Sculptor in Paris. And we'll see that behind this um, title is actually a whole story that's uh, barely um, written on, on if it uh, were of uh, Paula's work. So I'm very happy to um, have the occasion to look um, anew on this uh, figure which once was mentioned among Picasso, Modigliani and Chagall on the building of modern uh, art in Paris but um, of which uh, Destiny uh, Lessa uh, is, is known. Um, we, we can, as a beginning, but I, I let uh, Paula present this extensively, uh, remind that uh, first Olaf fled uh, Ukraine uh, and, and the anti-Semitism that um, was, she was facing there uh, to immigrate to Palestine and then moved to Paris uh, to work in haute couture and uh, then becoming an inter international artistic uh, figure. And so behind those uh, trajectories uh, lays uh, a great body of work um, that we'll have the occasion to, um, to study tonight. So thank you very much, Paula, for accepting this lecture, for giving it here and for introducing us to this fantastic body of work. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, um, Hugo. And I'd also like to thank Françoise Cohen and the entire team at the Institut Giacometti for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's a thrill to be here live in Paris um, in this very special setting to tell you about my new book. In the mid-1970s, this small sculpture bust was found at the Marché aux Puces, the largest flea market in Paris, measuring only 17 centimeters high. Clearly signed C.H. Orloff and dated 1940, it was later confirmed as an authentic self-portrait by the artist, artist's granddaughter, who provides context as to how this piece fit into the artist's life and work. This piece was likely pillaged from Orloff's studio by the Nazis during World War II, when more than 100 of her works were stolen and vandalized. Hanna Orloff was a Jewish emigre numerous times, first from the Ukraine to Palestine, then to Paris, after that a forced exile in Switzerland during the war, and finally, with her return to Paris, followed by frequent visits to Israel, a victim and survivor of the Nazi atrocities. She made this piece during the Nazi occupation of France, when French and foreign-born Jews were banned from public spaces, forced to observe a curfew, and wear the yellow badge with the Star of David and the word Juif written on it. Professionally stifled and prohibited from exhibiting or selling her work, 
Orloff strategically created what she called sculpture de poche, or pocket sculptures, works so small they could easily fit in her pocket. This self-portrait bust, intentionally signed and dated, is emblematic of the art artist's migrant experience. Her strong profile and stoic facial expression give dignity to a nearly untenable situation. It shows Orloff's desire as an established 52-year-old artist to document the traumatic experience of being uprooted yet again. I first encountered Orloff's work when I was researching my book, Women Artists in Interwar France. Standing in her atelier here in Paris, I was captivated by the rows of plaster, wood, marble, and bronze portrait busts lining the wooden shelves on several skylit walls. The sculpted faces, portraits of her friends, fellow emigre artists and intellectuals are grouped together as if in hushed conversation. Who were these people, I wondered, and what could their portraits tell me about this fascinating woman? Orloff produced over 500 documented sculptures in a range of materials. In light of the constraints that she faced as a woman and a Jewish emigre, her productivity and commercial success is astounding. She made her career in France and Israel, but always returned to this Parisian studio to make her work. Orloff's rapid rise to, frame, to fame and commercial success as a woman sculptor and portraitiste de Montparnasse is legendary. After arriving in Paris as a seamstress in 1910, by 1923, her work had entered the French National Collection. And in 1925, she became a French citizen and was named Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. The next year, in 1926, she commissioned the notable French architect, Auguste Perret, one of Le Corbusier's teachers, who designed Le Havre and also the Champs-Élysées, uh, the Théâtre, to design this studio as one of the first live-work spaces for artists in Montparnasse. It became a popular meeting place for international artists, writers, and intellectuals, especially those from Palestine and later Israel. My first visit to this magical place led to a decades-long fascination with Orloff and a desire to share her life story with a broader public. Throughout her career, Orloff strategically manipulated public photographs images of herself as a modern woman sculptor, a mother and a Jewish emigre, and images like this one were integral to her success. When she was interviewed for the French Jewish journal L'Arche in 1959, Orloff described, mes trois points difficiles dans ma vie, première juive, deuxième femme, troisième mère, I faced three major difficulties in my life. Jewish, woman, mother. My book explores how these intersecting identities, combined with Orloff's transnationalism, contributed to her particular approach to modernism as an important and understudied artist of the École de Paris. A key part of my methodology throughout the book is to explore how Orloff chose to represent herself in professional settings like this photo throughout her career in light of these intersecting identities. At 24, uh, in, in 1924, at age 36, she hired the American photojournalist, Therese Bonny, to photograph her in her studio to promote an upcoming exhibition. I chose this image for the cover of my book as it reveals her imposing physical presence muscular body type, and forceful attitude. She sits boldly on a pedestal, her arms folded proudly across her chest. The image of a live woman on a pedestal makes us think of the Pygmalion story. In the Greek myth, the male sculptor Pygmalion creates a sculpture so beautiful, he falls in love with it and brings her to life. I see this photo of Orloff as evoking this myth, but turning it on its head, Notice how she pictures herself as both the maker and the object of our gaze. 
She also reverses the gender dynamics by posing in between two of her own sculpted portraits of men. Her posture echoes that of her sculpted portrait of her friend, Ukrainian painter and graphic artist, uh, David Asipovich Widhoff. Orloff commissioned this photograph from Bonnie around the time she exhibited Widhoff's portrait at the 1924 Salon d'Automne to great acclaim. Critics describe this large and playful portrait as a standout, one of the clous of the whole Salon, and la lauded Orloff as chief among the distinguished foreigners in the section devoted to sculpture. It's a quote. The Musée de Luxembourg, the National Museum of Contemporary Art in France at this time, acquired it. Now the Israel Museum in Jerusalem uh, later followed suit and acquired its own bronze cast, attesting to her multinational identities. My book argues that Orloff's work offers a case study of transnationalism, a term that was coined by the American pacifist Roger Bourne in 1916 in a speech to the Menorah Society at Harvard University, during which he described the Jewish diaspora and Zionist movement as, quote, a model for how cultures could be both strongly cohesive and very flexible at the same time, unquote. While transnational or other terms such as diaspora or cosmopolitanism were not widely used in Orloff's lifetime, I'm engaging with them here as contemporary terms and theories to avoid a new perspective, to offer a new perspective on the École de Paris. Orloff strongly identified with two cultures and nation states, France and Israel, and her critics tended to emphasize her association to one of them more than the other, depending on their own nationality and background. While transnationalism evades easy definition, I'm interested in the way in this particular framing lends itself to the study of Orloff and other Jewish emigre artists who identified as bi or multinational. While they were associated with specific nation states, and some of them, like Orloff, contributed to nation building in Israel, they also lived in Paris as transnational others. Orloff's case study suggests new ways to conceptualize artistic identity in the context of modernism. We need to take into account the fact that many artists in this period belong to multiple groups and that numerous allegiances can coexist if not complement each other in their work. The diasporic nature of Orloff's life and work also prevents linguistic complexities in conducting research in an archive that exists in di diverse locations. And you can imagine this book took me all over the world. Um, this makes it particularly challenging to do this kind of research, which contributes to her marginalization in the history of art. Similarly, in terms of gender, Orloff's story mimics what feminist art historian Griselda Pollock has described as a pattern of how art history has, quote, excluded, exiled, derided, and effaced women artists, end quote. Many of them who, like her, were quite famous during their lifetime. For many decades following Orloff's death, her work was understood as derivative of her more famous colleagues like Modigliani, Chagall, and Soutine, and the innovative nature of her work and experience as both a woman and a Jewish emigre have not been included in canonical accounts of the École de Paris. And here we see one of her very first um, sculpted uh, torsos of the female body from 1912. Um, uh, you can see she's looking at Egyptian and Assyrian art. She's visiting the Louvre. Um, she's uh, a new student at the École um, uh, des Arts, uh, uh, National des Arts Décoratifs. Um, in the center, we see a portrait by Modigliani, a very quick drawing that he did of her, which he often did of his friends. And he's inscribed it in Hebrew, Chana bat Raphael, Hana, the daughter of Raphael, that was her father's name. And on the right, um, a very playful portrait of Chagall's young daughter, Ida, from 1923. 
And usually in the um, literature with Orloff and Modigliani, um, one sees this work and says she's influenced by Modigliani. But if you look at his work, he's not doing these kinds of nudes until the later teens. So I argue that these relationships were reciprocal. And these artists were ex clearly exchanging works um, and looking at one another. So they were looking at her as much as she was looking at them. While curators in France and Israel remained interested in Orloff's work through the 1960s, following her death in 1968, her critical reception was not nearly as strong in either country as it had been during her lifetime. Apart from my book, the late French dealer Félix Marcillac's catalogue résonné remains the most comprehensive publication in French on the Orloff's life and work. Marciac championed the rediscovery of Orloff in France in the 1990s. His catalog draws heavily from Germaine coutard samons unpublished dissertation from the Sorbonne in 1980, with more recent doctoral studies by Sissy Grossman in the US and Anne Grobo Dreyfus um, here in France. Solo exhibitions followed her death at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art and the Rodin Museum in Paris. And more recently, we're seeing a lot of renewed interest as um, museums in, in France and abroad are interested in showcasing the work of women artists of the École de Paris. And we have two of the um, curators of the upcoming exposition of Hanna Orloff's work at the Musée Zadkin, opening in November here in Paris with us tonight, which is wonderful. Um, so there's a lot of renewed interest, and um, I believe there's really a need to reevaluate um, Parisian modernism, including works like hers, as well as the history of art in Israel and modern Jewish history. I chose to frame my book around the ways in which the three themes of gender, migration, and transnationalism form a complex lens through which to explore Orloff's multi-layered negotiations of identity and self-representation. In what follows, I'll explain how these terms apply to my analysis of a selection of Orloff's sculpted portraits and figurative works, with a particular emphasis on works that engage with themes of Jewish and gender identities, while also sharing her fascinating life story. In the final section of the paper, I'll briefly address Orloff's critical reception and legacy, commenting on both the French and Israeli contexts uh, and the ways in which her artistic production intersects with gender politics in both countries. Migration, the act of moving from one place to another, sometimes repeatedly over time, with the intention of building a new life in a foreign place is a key component of Orloff's experience of Jewish diaspora and both living and making art in the context of the École de Paris. While it brings the promise of an improved quality of life, it involves a complex series of negotiations that destabilize concepts of home and belonging. Whether a result of forced migration, as in Orloff's family's escape from the brutal pogroms in southern Ukraine, and relocation to the colony of Petatikva in 1905, where she lived and worked as a seamstress and new Hebrew woman. Or we can examine the concept of voluntary displacement, as in the artist's decision to move alone at age 22 from Palestine to Paris in 1910 to study fashion and art. And if you look at the change in her appearance, it's quite dramatic in the 1905 photo on the right where um, she's wearing her hair short, she is, is this new Hebrew woman, she's playing sports, um, she's uh, contributing to a whole new culture there, and then in France um, where she's working in this uh, maison de haute couture and having to completely reimagine her identity and appearance. As a result, like most migrants, she experienced the simultaneous feelings on the one hand of displacement and on the other of belonging to more than one world. In, we, in these two photos, we see the young Orloff simultaneously studied classical French sculpture at the state-sanctioned École des Arts Décoratives, 
while also participating in the avant-garde Académie Russe, founded by the Russian emigre artist Marie Vassiliev. Oh, sorry, I'm on this slide. <laughs> At the Ecole, she copied the work of French masters at the Louvre and learned to speak French, while at the Académie Russe, she experimented in avant-garde techniques and conversed with her émigré colleagues in a mixture of Hebrew, Yiddish, and Russian. From the very beginning of her artistic formation in Paris, Orloff led a transnational life. For Jewish emigre artists, including her friends Chagall from Russia, Soutine from Belarus, Kisling and Alas Halika here from Poland, Paris was the center of cosmopolitanism and a metropolis that, constitu uh, that con constituted artistic and political freedom. They also had to negotiate public expectation to assimilate to French culture. As immigrants to France, a condition of their naturalization was the expectation to disavow ethnic, cultural, and religious identities and to embrace the French Republican ethos. And for some, the result was what scholar Sander Gilman has described as, quote, Jewish self-hatred. It has been well documented, documented in the work of Romy Golan, Kenneth Silver, and others that a group of conservative Parisian critics writing during the interwar years believed that the many émigrés and Jewish members of the École de Paris had, quote, infected the purity and realism of French art in contrast to the work of native-born artists of the so-called um, École Française. Some artists even changed their names. Halika was born Rosenblatt, and we have a Halika specialist with us tonight as well, which is wonderful. Um, and converted to Catholicism as means to assimilate in light of widespread anti-Semitic and xenophobic beliefs that the work of, quote, Jewish and foreign artists contributed to the decline of French culture. Hannah Orloff chose a different path. She was committed to developing her own art practice that offered a positive representation of Jewish identity while simultaneously maintaining ties to Palestine and assimilating to French culture. A photograph of the 24-year-old Orloff, taken two years after her arrival in Paris in 1912, sheds light on the artist's emerging self-image as a modern woman, an emigre, with a strong sense of pride in her Jewish identity. She sent the image back to her family in Palestine. <clears throat> Excuse me. She sent the image back to her family in Palestine with an inscription in Hebrew on the back, Chana be Avoda, Chana at work. Her own facial features stand out in dialogue as if asking her audience, what does it even mean to represent a Jewish face, a Jewish body, or to create a Jewish portrait while being a modern transnational Jewish woman artist? Quotes from interviews reveal how she felt like an outsider when she arrived in Paris, stating at an interview, quote, at the time, I was still considered a foreigner immigrant. I hardly penetrated the essentially closed French society, which is usually estranged towards its foreigners and immigrants. Orloff's early visual representation representations of Jewish identity counter the many negative stereotypes of the Jewish body that circulated in French popular culture and in Europe at large for decades in response to the Dreyfus Affair. The controversial trial of the Jewish captain in Paris in 19, 1894 for treason. Jewish males were commonly portrayed as either weak and emasculated or avaricious and conniving and women overweight, overbearing maternal figures, or hypersexualized femme fatale. It was common at this time in Paris to see caricatures of European Jews with orientalizing, in quotes, facial features as a way of marking non-white difference and questioning just how far east the racial origins of Jews extended. And we saw images like this in the Sarah Bernhardt um, exhibition recently, um, caricatures of, of her based on her identity. 
Um, Orloff nonetheless relied upon the logic of physiognomy to counter such negative stereotypes about Jewish women by creating her own new visual archetypes in works like The Two Jews. Given that she came from a Zionist community in Palestine that endorsed the writings of Theodor Herzl, the father of political Zionism, it's not surprising that Orloff was interested in creating her own version of the counter image of the new Jew, Herzl's authentic Jew, that emerged in early 20th century Zionist European culture as brave, masculine, and admirable. Orloff's gender, Jewish identity, and social class played an important role in her own questioning of place and status and critical reputation from the very start of her career. During the winter of 1915, two years after her first exhibit at the Salon d'Automne, she met Ari Yustman, a Warsaw-born poet and writer from a Jewish background. Yusman was friends with Apollinaire, Max Jacob, and Modigliani. And at this time, they joined in the production of an avant-garde journal called SIC, or um, sh short for Sounds, Ideas, and Colors, led by Pierre Abel Albert Biro, a French writer and journal editor. And in this context, you can see they were working together. Um, Jusman was writing poetry. She was making woodblock prints, clearly inspired by cubism here, um, news and image of uh, Judith. Um, and yet she sensed resentment from some of her colleagues. When asked about her early stylistic evolution in Paris um, in an interview, she said, quote, the Cubist reproached me a lot. One time the French artist André Lotte told her she needed to, quote, do so little to become one of us. And he suggested that by adding less individuality to her work, she could fit in more. Um, and so she felt very stifled um, and pressured to make her work kind of move more and more towards abstraction um, and describe this experience as one of gendered competition. She um, said to the journalist, quote, my dear comrades provoked me so that I would leave, so that I would disappear. A photo from the opening of her very first solo exhibit in her studio on the Rue d'Assas in 1917 shows her dressed as the modern woman seated by several works, including the Amazon from 1915 on the right. And we see here how um, she's engaging with visual codes of social, sexual, and economic freedom ascribed to working women during this period. Um, and then on the upper left, you see La Famille, um, Le Baiser La Famille. Um, this is in the Musée d'Art um, et d'Histoire Juif here in Paris. And this takes up a more traditional um, uh, art historical theme. And so we see um, she's straddling, uh, this is the period of World War I, and she's straddling these different um, uh, images and messages around women and emancipation, around the war and women take over, taking over men's roles during this period. Um, this is also the time when she has just married and is soon afterwards expecting a child. Um, so she's navigating all of this um, in her work while trying to find her place in the avant-garde. And this is the time when you have um, her colleagues and friends, Picasso, Modigliani, Lipschitz, Brancusi, Zadkin, Archipenko, who are um, you know, looking at uh, so-called primitivism and um, looking at black art and um, art from African and oceanic um, uh, uh, geographies, and is she going um, to the Parisian Musée uh, d'Ethnographie de Trocadero? We don't have evidence, but she's clearly in this milieu, and you see an Eve on the left, um, some of this influence um, in the way that she's treating the volumes of the figure, that she's aware of this trend and developing her approach. But we also hear in these interviews that she um, kind of wants to move back and forth between um, figuration and more experimental practices. We can't underestimate how the global challenges of war and pandemic impacted Orloff's work in her career. 
And just as an aside, I was writing this book during our pandemic, and um, the resonance was really powerful and really difficult and sad. Um, so the Spanish flu pandemic hit Europe in the spring of 1918, and Orloff had just given birth to a son, Ellie, whom they called Didi, a few months prior. And um, in an interview, she describes um, giving birth in a hospital where there are uh, patients from the pandemic and you know, being on a gurney basically in the hallway and how difficult this was. Um, her husband, um, Ari, worked for the American Red Cross at this time as a medic, so he was helping transport um, the injured um, to the local hospitals. And um, he started really understanding the seriousness of the Spanish flu um, before she realized it. And they were living on the Rue d'Assas um, with this you know, young baby to keep trying to keep healthy. And she described in one interview the Rue d'Assas geographically. She said, this street um, uh, was the last, this is a quote from a journalist, the last and silent Via Dolorosa of the epidemic victims. This street led to the Montparnasse railway station where the dead were brought to be buried outside the city. Disturbing scenes occurred in this street. Entire families were lying on the hearses which often reminded us of the horror stories about the Black Death Plague in the Middle Ages. You couldn't run away from such silent scenes of death. Thousands of watchful and demanding eyes saw death. The atmosphere in the street weighed heavily on us, the living ones. And this is an interview with a journalist where we can't be sure if these are her exact words. I write a lot about my use of these interviews in my book. Um, and so during the second week of January in 1919, less than two months um, after the armistice was signed and the war ended, um, Ari Usman fell ill. And at first he started feeling better, but his condition worsened. And um, sadly, a few days later, on January 12th, 1919, um, he died. And he was only 30. And they had this child who they literally only eight days earlier on January 4th had a, a birthday party, the, the son's first birthday. And Ari was passing out cigarettes and celebrating. He was reading his poems out loud, um, tartine, you know, a, a typical birthday party. So this shows you just how that pandemic really impacted very young people uh, more than, than our recent pandemic. So she was now a widow, and soon after her husband's death, her young son developed polio, adding further to her challenges. Um, her family back in Palestine encouraged her to return. Um, she also had a brother, two brothers who immigrated to Australia who wanted her to come there. Um, but she was really insistent that she was now Parisian. She wanted to make it as a French artist. And she started producing graphic work. And you see her um, there in the middle, her self-portrait as a widow in a woodcut. And you can see she beautifully used the grain of the wood in this um, series. And she portrayed many of her Jewish emigre friends who surrounded her and helped her with the baby and helped her grieve at this time. And shortly afterwards, she was commissioned um, to illustrate um, a volume called Figure d'Aujourd'hui. Um, it was kind of a who's who of contemporary art and literature from the day. And uh, Orloff was very savvy, even in this you know, few months out of grief. This um, commission was basically a calling card. So she would ask the artist whose portrait she needed to make to come to her studio and sit for a drawing, including Picasso and all of the pictures. Uh, individuals pictured there. So many of them she already knew, but it was also a chance to meet new people. And I think this was um, part of the beginning of her really taking to portraiture, um, which she moved to her um, sculpt sculptural practice. So soon afterward, she developed a prolific um, practice of sculpted portraiture, which I interpret as a powerful vehicle for exploring gender identity, Jewish subject subjectivity and transnationalism. Portraiture is rarely considered central in modernism, particularly the sculpted portrait bust, 
And yet, uh, her work, um, almost half of the 500 sculptured sculptures that we know of, a um, little less than half, are portraits of some kind or another. So she started creating this kind of who's who um, in the Parisian art world. And if you visit her studio today, this is the portraits, many of the plaster casts and busts are on the wall. And it's just magnificent um, seeing them there. Um, one of her early um, portraits here is of Ruven Rubin, um, who's uh, a Romanian-Israeli painter and founder of the Eretz Israel style of um, painting. And he, um, you see him uh, representing himself in a self-portrait on the right with a very elongated face and refined features, this kind of Byzantine style um, that she echoes in her treatment of the figure. Um, and he had come to Paris and um, was a young immigre art student. And there's a wonderful anecdote in his memoir where he describes going to visit her in her studio. And she's singing in Hebrew. And there's a big pot of borscht on the stove. And then there's a screen. And you know she's sculpting. And, and be, he realizes behind the scene is her son who's resting, um, you know, who suffers uh, muscle spasms and symptoms from polio. And just the way she you know, juggled these different aspects of her life was really quite remarkable. Also in her circle um, were um, the psychoanalysts, Dr. Otto Ronk and his wife, Beata Ronk. Um, and they had moved to Paris after Otto left the Viennese Psychoanalytic Institute. Um, and he was in the whole Freudian school. So they were very close friends, and Tola, um, Be her name was Beata, but she went by the nickname of Tola, became one of her closest friends and confidants, and they wrote letters throughout World War II that were helpful for me in writing the biography. Um, and so they connected her also to other clients in the psychoanalytic circle. Um, interestingly, many women psychoanalysts, um, uh, European emigres who went to the States, um, and I think it's interesting, um, Orloff's ease and comfort in representing the female body, sexuality, motherhood, um, and childhood um, must have drawn these early women psychoanalysts to her work. She also, Orloff, was part of a community of sexually and economically liberated Parisian modern women artists. Um, and here uh, she's sculpting her friends. In the center is Natalie Barney, an American expatriate writer um, who took an alter identity as an Amazon and would dress in the riding hat and clothing. And Barney's life partner there was Romaine Brooks, also an American expat. Um, and she um, also painted beautiful, very striking portraits of the lesbian art community in Paris at the time. And um, Orloff's background in uh, haute couture, I think, um, really inspired her treatment of clothing in the sculptures, which is quite interesting as well. And then on the right, we have um, Claude Cahin, a very prolific artist um, who worked in photography, um, and uh, is quite celebrated now in exhibitions about surrealist art. Um, and they were close friends. Cahant dedicated some of her writing to um, Orloff. So you see all these different circles that she navigated so fluidly. I thought this was an interesting comparison, thinking of Orloff as the new Hebrew woman and kind of the masculine appearance that she took in Palestine before um, coming to Israel, uh, before coming to Paris, sorry. Um, and uh, this idea of the new Hebrew woman, um, historian Margalit Shiloh has written about the contradictory nature of this female type. She writes, quote, on the one hand, she's a new woman exemplifying the hoped for equality, and on the other, the traditional woman still loyal to her commitments to husband and children. So this is what Orloff left behind in leaving Palestine. And um, he, here in this photo, she posed for um, a photographer named Abraham Soskin, who was popular in the 
Jewish diaspora and took photos of many prominent individuals. As a professional artist whose career took off in the interwar years, here we see how Orloff both drew upon and refuted uh, popular stereotypes of women artists by presenting herself on the one hand as the modern woman and the other aligning um, motherhood with creativity, which we'll see in a moment. And in this image, uh, the German sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld became interested in the photo of Orloff uh, that I showed you previously um, in the context of his own research into the relationship between gender, sexuality, and creativity. And this image appeared in um, his publication, Scientific and Visual, Ana Visual Analysis of Sexuality in 1926. And it was an archival collection of 900 photos and illustrations of individuals whom he assessed did not conform to, quote, normative gender identities. Um, and uh, looking at modern women artists working in Paris and Berlin. Um, so you see how her image was appropriated for um, this study. And this, this um, Hirschfeld was, um, you know, very much an advocate for the, the queer community at this time and had a whole um, office of, of research in this area. Um, so here she's positioned among um, other modern women artists, um, Aja Baker, Renee Sintenis, Lada Pritzel, and others um, who are challenging normative sexual and gender identities. Um, so while Hirschfeld's study doesn't fully reject popular discourse on the relation between creativity and gender um, by suggesting that women who take on masculine <coughs> attributes in their appearance are able to fully embrace creativity in art making, um, he's, he's really um, looking at these different identities outside the realm of motherhood. Now for Orloff, um, in another photo here taken by Bonnie, she's, um, this is the same sitting as the other photo in 1924. Um, she is very proudly holding her son on her knees and celebrating her artistic identity as a mother as well as an artist. Um, and here you see she's surrounded by sculptures of mothers and children. There's a, a sculpted bronze um, bust of her son up here on the right um, in a maternity statue here. And then this is a 1914 um, uh, woman holding her child um, close to her chest. So she's really, um, interested in developing a self-image that shows off her dual identities as a mother and an artist and plays to public expectations of the female body as symbolically represented in motherhood. And you can see how journalists went with this, this type of image. Um, th these are from Vanity Fair, a, fo a popular um, magazine um, uh, today, still uh, in the interwar period, they would do many profiles, and she was profiled many times in the interwar period. Um, uh, and she's being shown here as a mother um, by an artist colleague, and then in a photograph, and then surrounded by, by her portraits. In an interview published in Le Petit Journal, Orloff publicly acknowledged the connection between her art practice and her identity as a single mother following her husband's death. When asked to comment on the challenges of becoming an artist, she responded by citing the famous German dictum about the role of women in society, Kinder, Küche, Kirche, children, kitchen, church. Orloff claimed that religion, cooking, and housework were for her secondary to the importance of raising children. Pour ce qui est des enfants, je crois que c'est vraiment la chose essentielle. En ce qui me concerne, en tout cas, avec mon art, naturellement. Anything to do with children, I believe, is truly the most essential thing and what concerns me most naturally in my art. She also goes on to say um, when a woman, quote, is especially and above all a mother, she does, not, uh, she does not live completely unless she experiences motherhood. 
Also, she writes, I'm convinced that for a woman creator or créatrice, maternity is necessary because life is the most profound source of all art, end quote. And this was problematic for some of her colleagues, um, among them Anais Nin, um, a, a popular woman writer who, whom she was friendly with, who was very put off by this. She was more interested in eroticism um, in her work. Um, and so it's interesting when you look at these modern women artists kind of teasing out uh, their different takes on these gender politics at the time. Certainly this position would appeal to French male critics whom subscribe to the state's pronatalist agenda, encouraging modern women to give up their careers and focus on procreation following the decline in population as a result of World War I. Um, and you see here Orloff uh, very frequently taking up images of nursing women. Um, often the bodies of the children are, are fused to the mother um, in, in very moving ways. And she engages directly with female embodiment, themes of maternal sexuality um, in unidealized uh, ways. And um, it's interesting to note that her grandmother back in Ukraine uh, was a midwife. And um, she would take the young Hana with her to the births. And so she was very comfortable from a young age um, looking at um, you know, women birthing and nursing and, and all of this. Um, in terms of the stereotypes about women and motherhood, um, there was one German critic, um, Adolf Gottlieb from L'Illustration Juive, who described this piece as, quote, conçu maternement, uh, ses sentis vécu extériorisé du fond des sensations charnelles. Um, and given her own espousal of um, the importance of the biological experience of motherhood, um, she would have taken that as high praise. Then you have other critics, um, like German um, Pavel Bachen, who read her identity in more anti-Semitic language as, quote, a Jewess and a little Russian peasant mama. Um, so that would be read into these types of works. Initially, anti-Semitic stereotypes about working class Russian Jew and Jewish mothers seem to shape this critic's attitude about Orloff and her work, um, downplaying her professionalism as a successful Parisian artist. And in the motherhood um, pieces, they rarely portray specific individuals, but stand more for universal themes of sexuality, fertility, creativity, reproduction. So by 1926, um, she became so popular and commercially successful that she commissioned Perret um, to build this home um, and atelier and this is literally only 16 years after emigrating to France, which is quite remarkable. Um, the next year, uh, 27, she was featured in two short monographs published in Paris um, by Edouard Descourrières and Léon Werth, and they reinforced her professional identity as a sculptor. Um, it was very common when writing about sculpture in this time to use um, artisanal terms and um, also to reflect on um, modernity and hybrid national identities. Um, Courrier's book was part of a series on contemporary French sculpture, but going back to my theme of transnationalism, he talked about her work as influenced by the Orient, by Russian music. So you see these um, you know, kind of stereotypes. He writes, Quote, it is logical that a Russian artist who is closer perhaps to Asia than to Europe would have deep roots, roots in ancient civilization with such strong originality, end quote. And so there's this kind of racialized language that I saw in the press. Um, and he also alludes to her identity as a worker. Um, in sculpture, he, he writes, one cannot cheat with the material. It must be conquered. Um, the masterpieces made by the workers' hands. And uh, the other author, Werth, used similar rhetoric um, describing her sculpture as ouvrière et manuelle. 
And here we see her posing with her tools. Um, if you go to her atelier, the front part was where she would display her work publicly, and then in the back, she had um, the place where she worked with her tools hanging on the wall. Um, and she liked this image of um, down-to-earth worker. And when she spoke with critics, she often stressed um, this type of image, how it takes hard work, physical strength, a modest upbringing, um, you know, coming from Ukraine that facilitated her success. So she took this route more than the, the femme artiste moderne. Um, she told a journalist from uh, Prager Press, quote, women are rarely sculptors, but I don't see any secret reason behind this fact. In my opinion, it's a question of physical aptitude, of resistance. To become a sculptor is a very difficult career. You must stay standing up long for hours. A woman can't always support this. I am, thank God, in good health and solid. So she really kind of um, embraced this um, idea of her strength. Um, Orloff chose never to work with one single art dealer and preferred to maintain control of her sales and her business dealings. She took part in numerous important exhibitions in Paris and gl globally throughout the interwar years, including a trip to New York and Chicago in 1929, exhibits in London, Amsterdam, Tel Aviv, with a long roster of international contacts and clients. And um, several of the articles uh, sorry, the art dealers with whom she worked were prominent women from Eileen Gray, you see her Jean Dessert gallery there, um, and later Katia Granoff in Paris to Marie Stirner in New York. Um, she took part in annual exhibitions of women artists, the Femmes Artistes Modernes. Um, in 1937, there was an exhibit of the Femmes Artistes d'Europe where she represented France for sculpture. And that same year, as anti-Semitism and fascism intensified across Europe, Orloff took part in an exhibit entitled Maître de l'Art Indépendant, Peinture et Sculpture, Masters of Independent Art, held at the Petit Palais. And this was connected to the last of the Parisian World's Fairs and was one of three large exhibits showcasing French art uh, for the international audience that was attending the fair. So this was organized by the municipality of Paris and focused on la vivant, or independent art, um, and the international artists of the Haute Ecole de Paris. And it's amazing, um, she was given her own room um, at this exhibit. Um, and uh, it featured 25 of her sculptures and positioned her in the ranks of Rodin, Maillot, Despio, Bordel, and then Lipschitz and Zadkin, the other two emigres that were included in this exhibit. So she had exceptional visibility um, at this moment um, when um, anti-Semitism is actually rising, um, featured as a French sculptor and the majority of these artists born in France. Orloff also played an important role as an advisor in the formation of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, where her first exhibition in Palestine opened in the spring of 1935 and attracted a record number of visitors. She shipped her sculpted portraits of Reuben along with those of other prominent Jewish cultural figures and here we see Chaim Nachum Bialik, known as the first uh, Hebrew poet um, in um, this period. Hana Rovina, who uh, was described often as the first lady of Hebrew theater, the Habima theater. Um, Zev Rechter, um, uh, one of the first prominent um, Jewish architects in Palestine who she commissioned to actually construct a second house next to her home on the Villa Sera. You can go see it. Um, uh, so uh, these are her friends, her colleagues, and we see her in a photo there at the opening of her first exhibit in 1935. And the idea of converting um, the mayor's house, Mayor Diesengoff was his name, the mayor, first mayor of Tel Aviv, into a museum really came 
to light in her studio in Paris. They were discussing this together. Um, so she was a vital part of advising um, the opening of the museum. And her work, of course, was exhibited again there in 1949 and then after her death. While Orloff actively forged links between Paris and Palestine throughout the 30s, such activities were halted during the difficult years of the Nazi occupation. Her tenacity led to her difficult escape from Paris in July of 1942, when she narrowly escaped the Nazi Veldiv roundup of Jews and fled first to Grenoble, then Lyon, then Geneva, with her 24-year-old son, Elie, whose physical disabilities made travel difficult. She alerted several clients in Geneva to her situation, and they arranged for her lodging, providing her with studio space and materials, and introduced her to collectors to help earn her income. During the occupation, several propagandist exhibitions opened in Paris that officially sanctioned anti-Semitism. The Vichy government and Institute of Studies on Jewish Questions opened Le Juif et la France at the Palais Berlitz in September of 1941, and it featured this horrific statue, um, Charles Perron's 30-foot-high sculpture, France Liberating Itself from the Jews. This monumental sculpture, which dominated the main rotunda of the multimedia exhibition, features a classical depiction of a young muscular woman with holding a child up in her arm while she fends off two repulsive elder Jewish male figures using her knees and a free hand. This piece speaks to Nazi appropriation of caricatures of Shylock, the Venetian Jewish money lending protagonist from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice and other stereotypes. And we can imagine that his take on motherhood, one of her favorite subjects in sculpture, um, would have been extremely offensive to her. I have no proof that she saw this, but imagine she knew about it. In spite of the great hardships of this forced exile, Orloff remarkably was able to produce more than 50 sculptures in Geneva and held a successful exhibition in 1945 at the Moose Gallery owned by the family of Jewish art dealers. And at this time in Geneva, um, it was um, against the law for um, emigres like her to sell their work. And I went to Geneva and I looked in the records of this now defunct gallery and saw the little workarounds that allowed her to sell her work so that she would have enough to live, she and her son. Um, and it, as we are in the Institut Giacometti, it's worth noting that Giacometti was, of course, also in Geneva at this moment. Um, living in Hotel Rive, and they must have spent time together. There was also Germaine Richier um, in Switzerland at this time, and many other artists that she knew. Um, so when the war ended and she returned to Paris as a migrant once again, she discovered that the Nazis had ransacked her studio and stole much of her work, brutally vandalizing what they left behind. Although her family tried to convince her to relocate to Palestine, she was determined to rebuild her career in France. In a photograph taken after she returned from living uh, for over two years in exile um, and found her studio pillaged, Orloff poses here before Le Retour, 1945, a piece documenting this difficult period and here she echoes with her own comportment the dejected facial and bodily expression of a seated, emaciated male figure who has returned, quote, from there. And she made many of these um, dozens of drawings of concentration camp survivors confronting the horrors of war and dislocation of the Jewish people um, at this time. Um, and she's, you know, taking up this Rodin um, penseur, the thinker pose with the um, uh, hands here and um, really uh, thinking about this 
horrific time and how the war um, allowed her to use a sculptural style um, that changed quite a bit. It's much looser, more textured and expressionistic than her earlier works um, that were created at the height of her fame. And there are many works um, of this later period in um, the atelier that you can go and visit um, that are less known um, to the public. Orloff chose not to include Le Retour in a 1946 solo exhibition at the Parisian Galerie de France, um, which was her first solo show in France since 1926. In fact, she kept it hidden under a sheet in the back of her studio for 17 years before exhibiting it for the first time in 1962 at the Galerie Katia Granoff. But she would show it to journalists, so I read interviews where she sort of privately shows it to them but says she's not ready to show it to the world. Orloff's experience uh, Orloff's experiences as a migrant took a unique dimension when Israel was founded in 1948 as an immigration state where citizenship is automatically granted to Jews. Throughout her life, she maintained close ties with Palestine and Israel became her second home. Uh, she purchased an apartment um, and made plans for several large exhibitions, monuments, as you see on the left, and portraits of prominent uh, individuals. We see David Ben-Gurion there um, in the center, the founding prime minister. Um, and she's um, creating these works often back home in Paris, so kind of going back and forth. But in the new state of Israel, she is now an insider. Many of her family members um, were part of building the early state. And she was well positioned as an artist to play a leadership role in um, constructing a new artistic culture in Israel while um, remaining um, her, her, her primary home in Paris. So thinking back to her earlier work in which she represented, um, she was represented as a modern woman and a young mother and an emigre. Um, here she's kind of coming full circle. This is a monument to a, a woman, a pregnant woman, um, who died in um, 1948 in the kibbutz of Ein Gev, and she is choosing to represent her as a mother um, with you know, thinking about also the fascist sculpture that I showed you um, in Paris. Um, there's uh, interesting echoes. Um, and so her, her new um, work is really serving a, a purpose in Israel um, created after World War II when gender, demography, and um, reproduction are central concerns to building the Israeli state. So she became a popular public artist to pay tribute um, to the early contributions of Israeli men and women. And here we see um, uh, her final exhibition um, in 1969 in is Israel. So she was planning a jubilee exhibition at age 80 um, at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. And she worked very hard for a year in preparation. And sadly, um, on the flight over to open the exhibit, she became quite ill and um, passed away shortly after her arrival in Israel. And so uh, they waited several months to open this exhibit. Um, but what I'm showing he you here is an image of her uh, funeral. And she actually lay in state in the Helena Rubinstein Pavilion of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which is remarkable. When, when do you see a woman artist laying in state? Um, and it just shows you the level of respect um, that she had um, in the country at this time, an enormous Crowds came to honor her and attend her, her funeral. Um, so she was very um, much seen as a legend and um, celebrated. Um, and yet, in some of the language 
of the exhibition catalog, Chaim Gamzu, the museum curator and director, describes her as, quote, a dreamy girl who um, he credits her husband for introducing her to Modigliani and Soutine and Chagall. And you get these stereotypes again that I think then proliferated into the art historical literature. Um, in France, um, uh, the Rodin Museum also organized a large retrospective um, after her death and um, celebrated her work um, and uh, her uh, second uh, patrie. She helped organize a Rodin, the first Rodin um, exhibit in Tel Aviv and was celebrated for that. And so um, both countries really um, paid tribute to her. So I, um, thinking back to um, her transnationalism that I started with, um, I think we get a sense that how stylistically her body of work um, really resists categorization um, and uh, within the various avant-garde movements that proliferated in both France and Israel from cubism, surrealism, and art brut here in France to social realism followed by abstraction in Israel. And so for women artists and emigres like her, I think there was this sense of not fitting into one style that's part of what ultimately led to their erasure from art history or marginalization. And I think her case study um, in the context of the Ecole de, de Modernité really shows us how it's possible to belong to multiple groups um, and that many allegiances can coexist if not complement one another. And just a quick anecdote to end today, um, I'd like to share the story of this wonderful sculpture in wood of her young son, Didi, um, which was uh, the subject of two lawsuits, one in Paris and one in New York. Um, it showed up um, at auction many years ago, and the um, family recognized it as an important work that was stolen by the Nazis and had great um, emotional value given the death of her husband um, around this time. Um, and so this created a long legal battle where the work was in limbo, um, and the sculpture um, was literally just returned to the family this January. Um, so this, this very year, and it will be on display at the Musée uh, d'Art et d'Histoire Juif um, coming this November in conjunction with the Orloff exhibition at the Musée Zadkine. Um, and I think this will be a wonderful opportunity to really reevaluate Orloff's contributions to modernism, what it means to be a woman in diaspora, um, and so I conclude, as we consider Orloff's legacy in the context of transnationalism and gender in modernism, it is crucial to acknowledge the decades-long struggle of families like hers to recover works like the child Dee Dee and have them returned in order to evaluate the full arc of an artist's life and work. Merci.